He was always a very caring child and very, I, I would classify him kind of as being pretty sensitive and uh, not over emotional or anything, but uh, he's very close to his mom. And uh, his dad has always been in his life. Um, Cullen was a um, middle child. Uh, we had a blended family. We have seven children, and he was smack dab in the middle. He, he was a quirky kid. As an adult, he was diagnosed ADHD. I think as a child, he probably would have been diagnosed that, although I know that it was just sugar that, that got him going. But in spite of that, he was extremely intelligent. I, of course, all my kids are extremely intelligent, but I started having teachers tell me how smart he was and how gifted he was. He was very intelligent. Uh, by the time he was in middle school, he was making uh, some uh, a, uh, an adapter for c uh, computers. This was, had to be in the early 90s. And he started selling these adapters uh, to people. You could buy them in the store, but he made them himself. He went to Radio Shack and put these adapters together, and then he could sell them cheaper than you could buy them in the store, and he, he made money that way. He started doing things in um, high school. He, started, he taught himself how to program and how to write code for the TI calculator, and he, um, he just always wanted to know, to, just to learn to learn more, to go further than what he was being taught in school. He, um, he was a really good kid. He was, never got in trouble. Um, he was in choir. He was in theater. He loved to act. He loved to um, be the center of attention. He taught himself magic. He... Um, he learned to play the guitar and started writing music when he was in high school. And then um, his, his guitar teacher would let him set up in his studio, and so he would record his music, which is, is one of the most valuable gifts I have now. My parents divorced when I was young. I was two years old, sucking on my thumb. They stayed friends for my brother and me, and we were still one happy family. Music was a big part of Cullen's life, music and acting. Um, he was in every play the school put on. He, um, he even did a SeaWorld commercial um, singing a voiceover. When he got in high school, he was already so proficient. He got an internship or something like that at a computer company. We lived in Austin at the time. But this major computer company, he got a, some type of internship. And I think by the time he was a senior, he was earning $25,000 a year. He was doing the work of some of their main engineers. And then once he graduated, he got a job with them for a while. I think he was making close to seventy, eighty, ninety thousand dollars 80000 $90,000 a year doing the same thing. When he was in college, he, um, he had an internship with Sigmatel. Um, they were, they, they came up with the chip for the MP3 players. And so he was on the team that worked on that. And he started having trouble um, shutting his brain down to sleep. So he got to where he's working in different time zones with people in different time zones. So he, he might have a client that he had to be up at three, four, five in the morning, spend a few hours uh, with that client or that company, uh, you know, doing the things that they needed him to do on the computer. So that, that interrupted his sleep cycle. So he went to a doctor and the doctor prescribed Ambien for him. And um, it was great. He took it and he would go to sleep. Well, soon one Ambien wasn't, wasn't doing the tricks, so he would take two. And then soon two wouldn't work, so he would take three. And then it just it started spiraling. Another thing about Cullen's childhood is that he would not 
take so much as an aspirin if the doctor didn't prescribe it for him. He wouldn't, he, you know, he would, did the doctor tell you that I had to take that? Did the doctor tell you? And, um, which is just so ironic that he became addicted to prescription drugs. He took Ambien and he got addicted to that. And I think at one point he was, he was taking enough it should have killed him. But uh, I know he had a serious problem with it. And we, when we would visit him, sometimes he would just sit in a chair and he would just be kind of like, kind of like a drunk person. You know, he'd be sitting there and he'd wake up, and he'd talk to you and stuff, and we'd confront him on, on his use and stuff. And he got to a point he would deny it. He would black out and drive his car and wreck it and end up in the ER. He um, he was still working, still still functioning, but he uh, started to doctor hop because you would only get 30 Ambien for one month, and he would take all 30 within a week. So he would start doctor hopping and his internship paid him well enough that he could do that. And um, I don't know when the oxy started. I don't know when. Well, he then found a doctor that that um, said he had ADHD, so he started taking um, medicine for that. And soon he um, got medicine for anxiety and then he would stub his toe and go to the ER and get oxy for pain. And it just became, it, it just spiraled. So we went through that <clears throat> with him. We got him in a couple of addiction programs. And uh, this was in, uh, I guess, probably when he was in his uh, late 20s or early 30s probably when this started. And uh, so, and he moved to uh, Seattle, worked for Microsoft up there for a while. And uh, he lived in Taiwan before he went to Seattle. So uh, in Taiwan, it, every place he went, he had sleep issues because he, uh, once the sleep issues started, they stayed with him. And he just wrestled with this. And I, I know he took other prescription medication for his problem, but I don't know what they were. As far as street drugs, I know that the pill that he got, that, or the prescription that he got that had the fentanyl in it was oxy, well, M30, oxycodone. And... Um, I actually have that bottle of pills, and I've recently tested it with test strips, and it has fentanyl in it. He, he wrestled with all of these uh, prescriptions, and uh, he would do pretty good sometimes. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, he, it, was, it was a struggle for him. So we got him. I don't remember how many times he went into a, uh, an addiction program, but... I remember one that he was in in Austin. He moved back to Austin, and he, uh, we got him into this program, and they, it was really good uh, because they explained to to him and to us how once you enter this addiction problem, the addiction mode, I'm going to call it, the drugs you take. Uh, whatever kind of drugs it is that you, you have a problem with, really change the structure in your brain. And so you have to know that you're really fighting this uh, chemical change in your brain. And you have to, it, it's a struggle to overcome that. And I, I think that that's something that a lot of people really just don't understand. They think these people who are addicted have issues of uh, self-control. Well, of course they do, but once they 
gets these drugs in their system, it's, it's going to alter the functions in their brain. It, it chemically creates, you know, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, but it doesn't take anything but common sense really to see this with your own eyes, that their, their whole way of thinking starts changing, and the longer they're in this addiction uh, mode, the more severe it, it can get. On April 27th, I was in bed, and it was 11.30, and my phone rang, which never happens. And it was my other son, and he just said, Mama, Colin's dead. And so that's how it felt now. Um, his wife had filed for divorce, and um, she called his brother to do a welfare check. And his brother happened to be in San Antonio instead of Austin. So he called his dad, and he, he got on the highway and headed to his brother's house. But his dad went to the house, and they got in the house and found him. He, um, he worked for Roku at the time, and um, he had... He still had his mouse in his hand. So he was working. I was sleeping and the door flies open and the most horrible screaming and hysterical crying that you could ever imagine uh, hit me in the dead of my sleep and uh, that he he had died. And uh, he, he was in Austin his wife had moved out of the house. Uh, his dad had come in. His dad lives between Austin and San Francisco, back and forth. His dad was in for a visit, and uh, his wife hadn't heard from him in a couple of days. And normally she would obviously have some communication with him. And she, so she called uh, our, our other son, my other stepson, up and says, you ought to do a check on Cullen, because I haven't heard from him. And Cullen on Saturday had been with his dad and uh, his dad's uh, husband. They'd been together. Everything was fine. And then Sunday, he was supposed to be with them on Sunday, and he do, didn't make it Sunday. So I think it was uh, Monday evening, uh, his wife called my other stepson, his brother, and said, you ought to check on him. Well, his brother <laughs> had to be going through divorce, and he, this has been going on for a while, and he, he had a date in San Antonio. That's 65, 75, 70 miles away. So he calls, he knows his dad is in town. He calls his dad and says, you need to go by and check on Cullen. So his dad went over there, and he flies back to Austin, and they actually all get there about the same time and go into his uh, house and uh, find him. And uh, it was it was horrible. So, yeah, it was a uh, all nighter. So, <laughs> bad, bad. I called uh, my youngest. Other two children, we have seven kids, hers, mine, and ours, and we have a daughter in Fort Worth, so called her, she came home. And my other son, another son, lives in Garland, and he came over, and so we, we were up the rest of the night. And then we went to Austin, and it was horrible. Now we got together with Cullen's dad and his brother and started to, started to put together an obituary. I look back and, and I was so blessed. Um, you know, we were all together just throwing out our ideas and um, Colin's brother Chris was typing it up as we all talked. Um, Colin's dad, just said, well, it needs to be whatever mama wants. It needs to be what mama wants. Just, 
just the kindest thing. Um, we really wanted it to represent Cullen and for it to be something that, that he would love. I know he wanted to live because he had just gotten his first COVID booster. And he was so excited that he was going to get to get outside of the house. He, he wasn't trying to overdose. He was, he was on a computer working. And uh, he had a good job. But he just, you know, got down, I guess, uh, with his divorce coming uh, in process. And... Uh, so he, he wanted a, some relief, and that's what's so dangerous with fentanyl. It's, it's, it's really a murder drug. Uh, people take all kind of drugs and have all kind of addictions, but they don't go out. This, this drug is killing people, and they don't even know it. He had the prescriptions in his, in his toxicology report, um, there were four, but fentanyl was the first one, and it was 1,600 nanograms of fentanyl and 36 nanograms of norfentanyl. And those were the top things listed on the toxicology. I'd never heard of fentanyl. I had no idea. And that's when I started researching and learning, and that's when I started saying that Cullen was murdered. You know, he didn't overdose. He was murdered. And one of the sad things about it in the city of Austin, they won't, they won't investigate these types of deaths. If he had died in the county, the county would investigate it. And, uh, but in the, the city of Austin does not. They never even asked for his phone. They didn't ask for his computer. Didn't. I took him to rehab two times. And one time I went to the fam the first rehab, I went to the family counseling thing and we're in there and he's like, well, mom, the only real problem I ever had with, with the way you brought me up was that you told me I could do and be anything I wanted to be. And well, I really just wanted to be a Berenstein bear. And I was like, what? <laughs> what? I think what he was saying was that he thought he was going to be Bill Gates or Michael Dell. He, um, you know, he was waitlisted at MIT, and he really wanted to go to MIT. Um, I think it's a blessing that he got to go to UT Austin and shine. But um, I don't know. Yeah, he wanted to be a Berenstein Bear. Open your arms to love. Don't say no. Open your arms to love. Open your arms to love. Open your arms to love.